Hello everyone. For the past 38 years, Dr. Ken Friedman has directed Friedman Chiropractic Center right in East Brunswick, New Jersey. His purpose is to improve the quality of the lives of his patients and community. In addition to his chiropractic service, Dr. Friedman also offers nutritional, weight loss, and purification programs. This, the area's preeminent expert on wellness, Dr. Friedman has appeared on MSNBC, News 4 in New York, WABC Eyewitness News, and News 12 New Jersey. He regularly hosts the Wellness Spotlight, airing on East Brunswick TV, which has won Jersey Access Group's award for the best informational program in 2015. He serves as chairman of the Middlesex County Health and Wellness Advisory Council. He's the president of East Brunswick Health Advisory Council as a member of the Association of New Jersey Chiropractors. Dr. Friedman offers business and industry a variety of programs that reduce stress, prevent injuries, and improve productivity. He speaks regularly to local schools and organizations on a variety of wellness and safety topics and is a back school instructor. And today's program is going to be about all three of these things. So thank you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. I want to begin by asking you a question. Who here has back pain or knows someone who has? Raise your hand. Um, why? We have the best health care system in the United States, and yet back pain is one of the leading causes of lost time from work and lost productivity, second only to the common cold. It sidelines more people, it's responsible for more lost days from work, and it afflicts just about everyone. And it's not something that old people have to have. It's something that young people have too, either from carrying a heavy backpack or through pregnancy and carrying a baby. It can afflict just about anyone. So tonight, I'm going to be sharing the experience that I've gained in my 38 years of practice in East Brunswick here, in personally having delivered over 4 million chiropractic adjustments and having provided exercise and rehab programs for the patients that I take care of that complements their chiropractic care and helps restore them to a healthier lifestyle. Now, before I discuss some of the things that you can do to be able to help yourself, what I want to do is first discuss the anatomy of the back. How is it built? Why does it develop problems? And if problems aren't corrected, what happens over the long run? So what I have here is a model, a plastic model of a spine. And if I hold the spine from the side, the same way that I'm facing you now, the spine, the person in this spine would be looking at this wall. This would be the back of the head. This would be the neck, the mid back, and the lower back. Now, what's important about the spine is that it carries the spinal cord and the nerves. That's important because the brain is the power station of the body. It generates all the energy that controls and coordinates all the various different organs, tissues, and systems within the body and orients you to your environment. If something should disrupt the flow of energy between the brain and the body, is that good or bad? bad. It's bad. So the spinal column is designed to carry the major extension cord from the brain all the way down. And the bones of the spine are designed to surround and protect these delicate spinal nerves. The brain is protected by a helmet called the skull, a, you know, a, a bone. The hardest tissue in the body protecting the softest, most delicate, most important tissue in the body. But if the spinal column were solid, it wouldn't allow us to be able to bend and move and perform a lot of the tasks that we need to on a daily basis. So the spine has been separated by cartilage pads that are called discs. The disc is actually a ligament which holds one bone to the next and provides shock absorption. These discs 
hold the bones of the spine together, and also help to allow the spine to move in various different directions. But most importantly, what the discs do is to actually separate the vertebrae and the spine. These discs in between the bones separate them so the nerves that come out off of the spinal cord that start all the way at the base of the skull and extend out off the spinal cord all the way down to your tailbone. These bones can be properly separated. And that way, the opening between these bones is nice and wide so those nerves can exit with very little pressure being placed upon them. What's also important about the architecture of the spine are the curves of the spine. The spine has three major curves, one in the mid-back going backward and then two going forward in the neck and in the lower back. Which curve is the one that you're born with? That's right, born with. You're only born with one. Which one would you say that is? Think about how a, a baby is in the uterus. Think about the positioning that a baby's in and how it's bent over. Which one would you say it is? The lower part. The lower part, okay. Another guess. Mid. The mid-back, mid correct. It's the mid-back curve because a baby's bent over. Now, the curve in the neck develops from the third to the sixth month of life. Curves are extremely important. In fact, an arc is the strongest architectural form. It's why in ancient Rome, in order to be, get, be able to get the water down from the mountain, there were archways with the aqueducts were made with archways that could carry the weight of the water down from the mountain. And if you look in Russia and other cold climates, what's the shape of the roofs? What's the they're round, they're domed, so the snow could fall off. And if you look at the top of the head, the top of the head is a dome also, so that when a baby is born, as it descends down the birth canal, the dome of the head helps to open the birth canal and pave the way for the shoulders and the rest of the torso to be able to follow. It's also domed to be able to distribute the weight, the pressure, I should say, through the birth process so that the brain isn't injured. So curves are extremely important. The curve in the neck develops from the third to the sixth month of life. Now what is it that a baby does at month three to six that it typically doesn't do before that? What does it do? It yes, it holds its head up. Now why then? because a human head on average weighs about 10, 11 pounds. So if you want to get an idea, here, would you hold that for me? Thank you, Duffy. This is a human head. Go ahead, Larry. Okay, that's a bowling ball that I picked up. The alley gave it to me. Now, hold it up, okay, with one hand. Now, if you notice how Larry's holding that bowling ball, what's he doing? He's carrying it where? Out here or close to his body? Close to his body. What the curve in the neck serves to do is to help distribute the weight from the head through the neck to the, to the torso. It's very important because there are more nerves from the brain that go through the neck than any other single part of the body. Plus, the nerves in the neck are the most susceptible to injury because the vertebrae in the neck are the most freely movable, allowing the head to twist and turn and move in so many different directions. So, thanks Larry. Now, we'll come back to this in a minute. From the ninth to the eighteenth month, what does a child do then that it didn't do before? Yes. Okay, so you're getting it. That's the same time, typically, when the curve in the lower back develops, from the ninth to the 18th month. And that effectively transfers the weight of the torso to the lower extremities, to the legs. Now, why am I telling you this? Why is this so important? Because some of the tools that I'll be sharing with you tonight, I'll be having you keep this in mind in order for you to be able to move safer, in order to be able to reduce unnecessary stress to your back, 
so that there's less chance of injury. What's the major injury that can take place in the back? Well, most people would say it's muscle ache or muscle strain, and that's very common. But one of the most common and most devastating problems is a condition called vertebral subluxation complex, or subluxation for short. A subluxation is a condition where one or more of the vertebrae in the spine misalign. Now, it's not a dislocation, it's less than a dislocation, it's a subluxation. And in a subluxation, the vertebra misaligns to the point where it puts pressure on the nerve. Now, if that puts pressure on the nerve, is that good or bad? bad. Why is it bad? Because you get pain. Okay, well, the interesting thing is, is that you could have pressure on the nerve and have absolutely no pain at all. Much the same way that, could you have a blockage in the vessel of your heart and have no pain? Mm -hmm. Can you have cancer in your body and have no pain? A cavity in a tooth and have no pain? Mm -hmm. Diabetes and have no pain? Yeah. There are many, many different types of conditions where your body's malfunctioning and yet there's absolutely no pain involved. So whether or not you have pain isn't really an accurate determinant on how well your body is functioning. How well your body is functioning, truly functioning, is based upon how well the energy is flowing between the brain and the body. Because all of the energy from the brain that's carried over the nervous system is going through or very closely around the vertebrae. Should the vertebrae misalign, the nerves get irritated, the energy doesn't flow well, and your body doesn't work correctly. Then yes, over a period of time, with the body not working correctly, you can have problems much the same way that when the motor in your car goes out of tune, your car may still start and it may take you where you need to go. You may not see it driving as well as it used to, but it still gets you there. But if you ignore it over a period of time, what happens to your car? It breaks down. Now your body is the vehicle that your life drives around in. And once that vehicle's worn out, you can't get another one. You can always buy another car, but you can't get another body. So the information that I'm going to give you is going to be very helpful for you to be able to take care of the one vehicle that you have so that you can have the best life possible. So what I first want to do is show you some of the things that you need to do to be able to protect the curves in your spine and be able to protect the nerves to prevent subluxation from taking place. Okay, now the, one of the first things I want to do is talk about how to sleep. Now this is a very special type of pillow. It's one of the types of pillows that I recommend to my patients that would require a pillow like this. It's a water pillow. You fill it with water and it can actually be custom sized to the needs of the patient. And you fill it with enough water so it keeps the head in a neutral position when you're lying on your side. A lot of people who sleep with pillows, the pillows are too thick or they're too thin. They don't fit everybody. So if they're too thin, then the head comes down this way. When you're sleeping on your side, it can pinch the nerves. If the pillow's too thick, if you have two bunched together, one can slip out or they're too thick, they push the head in the opposite direction. That's no good. It can pinch the nerves in the spine and subluxate the vertebrae. This pillow can be sized in a way where it can keep the head in a neutral position. When you go to sleep, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is, they, who here reads or watches TV in bed just to relax and, you know, wait till you're tired? Okay. Well, a lot of people do this. What I would suggest that you do is this. People stuff pillows up behind them. Does this look a little familiar? Okay. And then, they're against the headboard, they're reading or watching television, and then as they get tired, they do what I call the 11 o'clock slide, right? And the pillow comes down. Now, as the pillow goes down, what's happening to my head and my neck? It's being bent over. Now, as my head and neck are being bent over, what happens to the curve in my neck? Is it straight or is it curved? It's this way is curved or straight? Straight. Now. If you hold a bowling ball, here, put it in your hand. Go ahead, Mr. Duffy. Here, put your fingers in. Okay, now hold that up. Now you see how you have it close to you? Now, 
Watch what happens when your head goes out in front of your shoulders. You see the difference in the amount of pressure? Anybody else want to try this? It's significant, yeah. isn't it? Okay, so then people wonder, well, how do I get arthritis in my spine? Why does my spine wear out prematurely? What's going on? When you get subluxation in the spine, and the spine isn't working and moving properly, and the energy isn't flowing to the muscles that surround the spine and the joints the proper way, do those muscles work in a balanced way or an imbalanced way? Imbalanced. imbalanced. So if the muscles are working in an imbalanced way, like the motor that goes out of tune in the car, what happens over an extended period of time? Is it easier or harder to injure a muscle over time with the muscles imbalanced? Easier, easier much easier to do that. Okay, so that's why it's very important to make sure that your head is supported properly when you sleep. So put the pillow when you're sleeping underneath the shoulders so that it's supporting the shoulders and the head, not pressing your head down, but supporting both. And I like this water pillow because it distributes stress so much better, just like a water bed distributes stress. It's like a water bed for your neck and upper back. Okay, and uh, it helps keep the neck correctly aligned so most of the energy when you're sleeping between your brain and your body can flow properly with less chance of irritation. What about the one that curves the neck? The one? That's an excellent question. What about the pillows that are built with a curve in them? I won't recommend them. I've never recommended them, and I know a lot of people do. But I won't because as long as you're lying on your back and you stay in one position, you're okay. But the minute you turn into another position, now that curve is pushing into your spine in an abnormal way. It can actually injure the nerves and the alignment of the spine and produce subluxation. I like this much better because it fits and conforms to support you in a much gentler way more completely. And no matter how you turn or move, it conforms to your body, okay? Let's talk about the other curve, the curve in the lower back. Okay, I'm gonna take my jacket so you, off so you could see this a little bit easier, okay? Let's talk about the curve in the lower back. The curve in the lower back is very important, you know, especially when you're seated. So what's the most stressful position on the spine? Standing, sitting, or lying down? What would you say? Standing. Most people would say that. It would make sense because you're up on your feet. But actually, sitting is the most stressful position. It's actually 50 to 75% more stressful than standing is. That means that when you're out in a restaurant having dinner, the person serving you is under less stress than you are having the meal. So if sitting is the most stressful position on your back, then it makes good sense to be able to sit in a way that produces less pressure. So again, I'm going to give you the rhyme, preserve the curve. Preserve the curve. Just like the curve in the neck needs to be preserved, the curve in the lower back. So watch me, everybody. Watch me, OK? If I sit like this, now this is a very familiar posture, isn't it? If I sit this way, how's the curve in my lower back, good or bad? Okay, now 50 to 75% more stress in my lower back. And then to make matters worse, where do men typically put their wallets, guys? In the back, in the back pocket, right? Then you sit on the wallet with no curve in your lower back, with your back twisted like a chalk underneath one side. So over a period of time, you're watching the football game. Now we're coming in a football season. You're watching the football game, basketball game for a couple of hours, okay? <laughs> Here's where everybody changes their posture, okay? So you're watching the game, and it can throw the spine out of alignment. And, and a lot of people, when they have called me to come in, they don't call me typically because of a ma I mean, some of them have major events, car accidents, injuries, things like that. But most of the time, it develops gradually over time and insidiously, and they don't understand how they got this problem or why it's not going away. 
You see? So what I would recommend you do is sit with a good curve in your lower back. Now, it doesn't matter if you use the seat back or you don't have a seat back. The ball chair, you've seen those ball chairs that people sit on, they almost force you to put a curve in your lower back to balance on them. Plus, it also makes you use your core muscles, you know, to be able to strengthen those, and that helps to aid to stability, on, uh, aid with stability in your lower back. But preserve the curve in your lower back. That's very, very important. Okay? Next. Backpacks. Now, you probably don't carry a backpack very often. Every day. Okay, every single day? Then this is especially for you and for the viewers at home who uh, have school-aged kids that carry a backpack every day. I'm a certified back school instructor. I just did a backpack safety workshop for a local scout troop. And uh, it's a topic that is extremely important because the average, let me give you an idea of how much weight a child carries on their back. Now, this is a growing and developing spine, okay? They're not fully formed like us yet. So it's important to reduce stress with children. We think of so many things that children need to do to be able to protect them. Now they have to wear a helmet when they ride a bike and so on, okay? But yet, if we do the math, the average backpack that most kids carry weighs about 12 pounds, about as much as that bowling ball, 11 pounds. Now, a 12-pound backpack lifted 10 times a day. You know, in the morning when they leave the house and then they have to get on the bus and then off the bus and then into school and then walking around school and then going back home again, about 10 times a day. For some kids, it's even more than that. So 10 times 12 is 120 pounds a day. How many days in a school year? 180. So 120 times 180 is 21,600 pounds of weight, the equivalent of six mid-sized automobiles in one year on a growing and developing spine. So backpack safety is extremely important for everyone, especially children. Okay, now what do I recommend? Nice wide straps, straps that adjust at the top and at the bottom a handle so it could be easily lifted, zippers that open and close easily, and also a backpack that's the correct size. You don't want a backpack that's too large where you can't see the shoulders. You know, if it's covering up the shoulders of the person that's wearing it, that's not good. A lot of parents buy backpacks that are way too big for their children. You want to get one that's the correct size and you don't overload it. So the general rule of thumb is 15% of your body weight. The backpack should not exceed 15% of your body weight. So do the best that you can. Discriminate on what you put in. And when you load the backpack, make sure that you load it in a way where the heaviest objects are in the center. You pack the looser, lighter objects on either side. And the heaviest objects are the ones that are closest to the back of the backpack, the part that rests against your back. The backpack should have nice wide straps to distribute the weight over the upper trapezius muscle so it doesn't dig in. And it should be worn in a way where the backpack is just at the top of the upper back here, right at the base of the neck, and right at the bottom of the lower back this way. You see a lot of kids carrying backpacks and they're kind of bouncing off their butts. That's because the straps aren't adjusted properly. So it's very important that the backpack has those elements. I also recommend reflective material because it's going to be getting darker earlier. You want to be seen by vehicular traffic, especially if you ride a bike or if you're walking and you're crossing an intersection. Now, as far as lifting goes, and here's where preserving the curve becomes very important also. Whether you're lifting a backpack or any other object, you want to lift in a way that protects the curve. So you preserve the curve by bending at the knees, if you please. Okay, if you bend at the waist, what happens to my curve? Straightens it out. So you're in a weakened position. That's where a lot of people can bend over and lift. You know, 
being next to the fields, when New York Sports Club was next to my office, I had a lot of people who could take my big muscle-bound guys, they could take my legs and make a wish with me, okay? And, and they could bench 300, 400 pounds. And yet, how did they hurt themselves? They bent over to pick up a one-pound lock for the bar that the weights are on, and they blew their back out. How could that possibly be? Because when subluxations exist in the spine, and then repeatedly a person is doing things that undermine the spine's ability and strength, it renders you more susceptible eventually to injury and problems. So you want to keep your knees bent and preserve the curve. And then the last rhyme I want to give you is keep your nose between your toes, nose between the toes. So if I go to pick up the backpack or a pencil and I go like this, is my nose between my toes? No, that's bad. And why is that bad? Here's my model spine again. If I look, well, if I bend at the knees, I go down, there's very little pressure being placed on the lower back. But if I bend at the waist, my spine is stretched out and then to the side it can very easily pinch the nerves that are coming out in the lower back or pull a muscle that's already out of balance and, and improperly functioning. So what are those three rhymes that I gave you? Preserve the curve, right? Nose between the toes and bend at the if you please, okay? Those are three very important things. And when you're doing housework, let's say you're emptying the dishwasher, Okay, instead of bending over to empty the dishwasher, bend at the knees, take the stuff out, put it up on the counter. You're gonna find, everybody stand up for one second, put your papers down, okay? I want you to experience this. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. Bend forward from the waist and just stay there. Don't bend your knees. See, it's hard for you to do with your knees straight, isn't it? Okay, now, if you're like most people, even with a healthy back, you're gonna feel it down here, down at the bottom of your spine, right down in this area, yes? 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 Okay, now, straighten up. Now watch me, okay? Check this out. Open your feet up a little wider. That gets you closer to where you wanna go. Bend at the knees, okay? Keep your knees bent, and then come over. Stick your butt out, okay? You notice how you feel the stress now in the front of your thighs, but not in your lower back. On the, the knees. Muscles to the on the knees. On the knees. On the knees. Okay. We are all knees. Okay. Okay, have a seat. What about when they do the squats? They always, instead of flowing straight down, you see them put your butt back. Do you see that? So your knees don't go past. Right, your knees don't go past your toes. Well, that's a little different than just going straight down. Yeah, I, I, I take care of a lot of people who have lifting injuries. Yeah. You see, the, the problem, you need good technique when you're doing anything physically stressful, whether you're lifting weights or you're just going through your regular activities of daily living, even sleeping. That's what we're going over tonight, okay? But it's very important to make sure that your body is balanced and functioning correctly. And here's the biggest reason why. What percentage of the energy going through your spine would you say is going to your muscles and joints? Because when we talk about back pain, we're really talking about the muscles and joints being affected, yes? 80%. Okay, most people say about 80%, but in actuality, it's the other way around. Only 20% of the energy going from your brain to your body through the spine is going to muscles and joints. The other 80% is driving all of your organs and glands and tissues and systems. How you digest your food, eliminate waste, your immune system, how you metabolize sugar, all of the things that are going on are controlled, your metabolism, all of these things are controlled by the energy going through your nervous system. So if you notice that you're having back discomfort, then that's the tip of the iceberg that you can see and feel. That's affecting the 20% of the nerves, but what's happening to the other 80% of those nerves that are going through the same spine? A lot of people who experience back pain and back problems that are unrelenting also notice that they have other symptoms and conditions that are associated with it. Headaches, 
numbness and tingling in the fingertips or in the legs, or stomach problems or constipation, allergies, breathing problems, asthma, you name it, you see? So the nerves that carry the energy going through the spine control all of these things as well. Now, one of the single best things that a person can do to ensure that their body is functioning better and has less chance of injury is to have a spinal checkup to ensure that you don't have subluxations in your spine. Because if you do have subluxations and your body isn't balanced or functioning right, if my body's not balanced and functioning right and I do therapy, I put heat on it, I put ice on it, I do exercise, but my spinal nerves are being compressed and irritated and the energy isn't getting to my body so it can't heal, how is it gonna get better? It's not. I know, I know, we could take a painkiller, an anti-inflammatory and a muscle relaxant. Is that gonna fix it? No. If I pinch my finger so hard that it causes pain and I take a painkiller, how does that fix the pinching in my finger? It doesn't, you see? And that's why, typically, the treatment protocols that are around treating back pain have failed. They failed because those treatment procedures ask the question, how do we get rid of this person's pain? I think the better question is, why isn't their body healing itself? And if it's not healing itself to the best of its ability, what is it that we could do to remove those interferences and enable their body to function better? Well, the first thing you need is a properly functioning nervous system because it's the energy going from the brain to the body that controls that. But there's also a lot that you can do by the way of keeping the wallet out of your back pocket and watching how you sleep and how you bend and how you lift objects and so on. One of the single, another big thing that produces back pain is carrying excess weight. Now, every extra pound of fat that a person carries is four pounds of stress on the lower back. It's also an extra mile of blood vessels that the heart has to pump blood through. Fat is highly vascularized tissue. So if you're carrying 10 extra pounds of weight, that's, 40 extra, that's four of these bowling balls just about. So imagine being a good weight and being relatively strong and healthy, strapping four bowling balls to your body and going about your business. How do you think you'd feel at the end of the day? And if you had pain or misalignment, and then you strapped four bowling balls to your body and went about your day, the equivalent of 10 extra pounds, how would you expect your body to be able to heal itself? Or exercise correctly, you see? So it's very important to be able to eliminate the things from your diet that don't belong there. Cutting down on processed sugars, eating less bread, right? Uh, the things that would add unnecessary calories to your diet. Sound familiar? Okay. And, uh, and, and dairy, which is highly inflammatory too. There are certain foods like sugar and wheat and dairy that are highly inflammatory, meaning it causes the tissues in your body to become inflamed, very sensitive. So it's like throwing gasoline on the fire. So the spine's imbalanced, the nerves aren't carrying energy correctly, you might be carrying too much weight, you're moving in ways that aren't really the best way for you to be able to, to move and bend and sleep and do the thing, carry loads and do the things that you do. And then on top of it, you're eating foods that aggravate the sensitive tissues in that area that are already inflamed. How the heck are you supposed to get any better? And then if you take a painkiller or an anti-inflammatory or a muscle relaxant, what does that do to your stomach, liver, and kidneys? Not to mention the fact that if the pain, what's the purpose of pain in the body? We're talking about back pain tonight. Is back pain a good thing or a bad thing? If you look at the pain, What's the pain designed to do? Warning. Why? What is it warning you about? Right? It's like the light on the dash going up in the car. So if the light goes on on the dash in the car, taking a painkiller or a muscle relaxant, if the muscles are tight, and why would the muscles be tight? Because when there's subluxations in the spine and the energy is not flowing in a balanced way, 
the muscles in being used incorrectly tighten up to restrict movement because when you move further, it's putting more pressure and irritation on those nerves that aren't carrying the energy properly. It's splinting you. The pain is designed to splint you and protect you. But what if you circumvent that process? What if you take a painkiller or a muscle relaxant or something to reduce the inflammation that's created from things not working properly and rubbing and moving abnormally? It renders you more susceptible to further damage and further injury. And yet, that seems to be the story that so many people have gone through. Why? And remember I said that treating pain in and of itself is a failed system. This is why we have a problem with opiates today, which you're reading about and seeing in the news, because the whole purpose of opiates is primarily to treat pain. Do you know one of the top 10 reasons for emergency room visits in Middlesex County, New Jersey, is due to severe back pain? Okay, and what's done? Pharmacotherapeutics, see? so. If you're in a lot of pain, you can certainly understand the temptation to be able to get out of pain and take these drugs, but you have to appreciate that there's nothing for nothing in this world, and it can render yourself to creating further damage and, and further injury. Okay? So let's summarize what we've gone over tonight. Tonight we talked about the anatomy of the back about the importance of the flow of energy between the brain and the body, about the importance of the curves in the spine and correct spinal alignment. We talked about why it's so important for that energy to flow well and the single largest interference that we know of to the flow of that energy, a condition called vertebral subluxation complex. As a chiropractor, my training involves the detection, location, and correction of these subluxations, which relieves the pressure off the nerves and gives your body the ability to function better on its own and have the best capacity to not only self-heal, but also to improve your tolerances to the physical and chemical and emotional stresses that you're under on a daily basis. And the better your spine is aligned and the better it functions, then the less likely the processes will follow that cause severe degenerative arthritis and degenerative change. I've brought a, a series of models where if I pulled out a, you know, two segments of the spine with a disc and the nerves, I can show you the process that takes place. Normally, the vertebrae are correctly aligned. Here's the nerve. It carries the energy, and as long as there's no subluxation in the spine and compression on, compression on the nerve functions well. But should the spine go out of alignment and pinch that nerve, initially what can happen is, over, does that disc carry that pressure normally or abnormally? Ab volume. It, it, it carries it abnormally. Mm -hmm. Now the disc is soft, the bones are hard. So that constant abnormal rubbing causes the disc to what? It can bulge, but then over time, what can happen? It can start to wear thin. Over time, as the disc wears thin, the opening that carries the nerve gets bigger or smaller? smaller. If, the nerve, if the opening gets smaller, is it easier or harder for the nerve to become pinched? Harder. Easier for the nerve to become pinched, yes, yes. right? Easier for the nerve to become pinched if the opening gets made smaller. And then if it's easier for the nerve to become pinched and the disc is wearing thin, eventually the body starts to put calcium in the joints to be able to, now calcium is like nature's, well, it's the hardest tissue in the body. It's bone, okay? But when it starts to put calcium into joints, it's doing that to restrict movement. The body is interpreting what's going on as an injury. It's an injury. So what does the body do for an injury? If you ignore the injury long enough, the processes in the body continue. The body, as a last ditch effort, starts to infuse the area with calcium, to shore it up, to give it additional strength and support, but to do what? To restrict 
movement. And the calcium can be deposited either between the vertebrae, which eventually can fuse them together. I just had a patient who came to me with neck stiffness and pain, a gentleman in his late 80s. And when I took his x-rays, I saw that with the exception of the top two vertebrae in his neck, his entire spine was completely fused together. Now, this process takes place over decades, about 15 to 20 years to this point, 25 to 45 years to this point, and about 45 to 60 years after the first subluxations have developed. This is a process, folks. It's not an event. So all of a sudden now you go to the doctor, they give you an examination, they take x-rays and they say, well, the reason why you have this back pain or knee pain or hip pain or other types of problems is because you have arthritis. Well, of course you do. It's the process over many, many decades of degeneration and improper function. It's like you driving around with you, the idiot lights on in your car and then the idiot lights burn out, you ignore them, and you keep driving the car until eventually it's really not functioning well or doesn't start at all. You tow the car to the shop and then the mechanic says to you, you know what, your motor seized up. Well, of course it did, but it didn't just happen all of a sudden. It happened over many, many, many miles of driving with not enough oil and improper tuning, see? And the body's no different. Well, what happens if you have this degenerative change? There really isn't all that much you can do. We can't turn back the hands of time and put you back this way. And in that sense, medicine may be necessary to help control the pain and get you moving. You may need surgery to replace a joint that has completely worn out, like a knee replacement. But the one thing that helps every single person and a lot of progressive medical doctors, internists, orthopedists, obstetricians have found that by referring their patients in to have a chiropractic checkup and detecting blockages in the nervous system and by unlocking those areas and enabling the energy to flow better, it helps them get better clinical outcomes because a better health and healthier functioning body does better with physical therapy, requires fewer drugs, moves better, is stronger, and has less chance of severe complications and reactions. Pregnant women have easier, healthier deliveries, and chiropractic care is so safe, it's one of the only things that a pregnant woman can have. She can't have drugs, can't have physical therapy over a pregnant uterus, but they can have chiropractic care, and the research has shown that pregnant women have easier, less complicated deliveries and healthier babies. In fact, in my 38 years of practice, taking care of hundreds and hundreds of pregnant patients who have suffered from back pain, they've moved better, their pain's been relieved, they've had easier pregnancies, and you know what? Only one C-section in 38 years of practice. And considering that 25% or more of all births are C-sections in the United States today, I'd say that's pretty darn good, okay? And, and I use technology in my office that's state-of-the-art. I use the same technology that's used on the United States Olympic athletes to be able to mi measure muscle tone, muscle balance, mobility, even the balance and alignment of the feet. Did you know that back pain can come, and I didn't really discuss this, but back pain can come from a foot imbalance, even though you don't have any pain in your feet. How could that be? There's more bones in the foot than any other single part of the body. And if your feet go out of alignment, and that's the foundation, an imbalance here runs through the entire kinetic chain and throws everything off. So I want to thank you all for your time and your attention. You may have some questions tonight. I'm going to be wrapping up in a minute. For those of you who do have some questions and you'd like to ask me privately, we're not going to do that on camera, but I will remain for a few minutes. At the conclusion of my presentation, I'm going to ask you to please fill out the survey that I've given each of you. It will help me give better feed, get better feedback so I can always improve on the information that I'm bringing to the community. And if you'd like to stick around for a few minutes and ask me some questions, 
or if you're a little concerned about privacy and you'd rather meet with me privately, you can certainly do that. There's no charge to meet with me if you have a question or a concern. I offer consultations to the general public at no charge or obligation. I'm going to finish up with a story. It concerned a gentleman who came to me who had severe back pain. And he was coming to me for about three weeks. He could barely move when he first came in. And over the three weeks that he was coming in, he was doing great. It was a Saturday morning, about three weeks after he started. He was moving well, and he was in for his Saturday morning checkup. And he brought his daughter with him on that visit. And she was sitting in the chair, and he was lying down on the table, and I was over him as I was checking him. And when a patient brings a, a small child in to me, uh, it, it, it can be a little frightening for a child to see mom or dad lying down on the table like that in a vulnerable position with a big person like me over them. So I'm touching and I'm telling and I'm explaining to this little girl that Dr. Ken is checking daddy to make sure that his power is turned on, that daddy's body wasn't working right, but now it's healing much better as a result of Dr. Ken's care. And, uh, you know, daddy's really doing great. And uh, anyway, I looked at her while I was checking him, and I asked her, tell me, sweetie, what's the best thing about daddy since he's been coming in and getting chiropractic care? And she looked up at me, and she said, he doesn't hit me anymore. He doesn't hit me anymore. You know what? For me, this is more than just about stiff necks and sore backs and getting rid of pain. This is really about identifying and removing the interferences for you and your family and the people who you care about to have the best life possible. Even the sweetest dog will bite you when it's in pain. And we tend to hurt the people who we love and love us the most. And sometimes it's through words and sometimes it's through worse than that. And I feel so blessed to be able to, 38 years from starting my practice, to still be so passionate about what I do and the help that I bring to this community. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with me. I hope you've learned a few things. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to please share it with others. A candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. To paraphrase Voltaire, the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who had the ability to help others, but instead stood idly by. So now that you know, more about how to take care of the back and why it's so important and some of the things that you can do. Please share this information with others. And if you have any questions or concerns, you're certainly welcome to give me a call. I'm a resource for you. I brought a number of different resources with me, materials, educational pieces, uh, articles I've written that have been published in the local newspaper for you to take. They're yours. I'm also going to be having a special presentation in my office called An Hour of Power. It's a great presentation with information that we haven't covered tonight that will give you more information on what you need to know to be able to have the best life possible, reduce your dependence upon drugs and surgery, and be able to live your life to the fullest. Thank you very much, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.